if you've never let them fail, if you've never let them grow, if you've never allowed autonomy for them, then they won't have those skills when you're not there. Hi, Dr. Dom. My name's Ellie, and I'm 10 years old. I know mental health is important, but I don't really understand what it is or how it works. Some kids get nervous before a test or a game or have trouble sleeping at night. Do they have anxiety, and what can they do about it? Well, thank you for such a great question. My name is Dr. Dom, and I'm a board-certified adult and child and adolescent psychiatrist. So the first thing, which is great, is that you're asking questions about it. So you're wondering what anxiety is and if it might be a problem for you. So that's amazing because that tells me that you have a lot of insight and you're paying attention to your body and mind. So anxiety, this is such a common problem and this is such a great question. And it's so important to address because we've been seeing as behavioral health care providers, anxiety going literally through the roof. So the first thing I want to say is let's not over pathologize anxiety and what I mean by that is let's not make it a bad thing right off the bat because the truth is a little bit of anxiety is probably pretty important for you. This is how I like to explain it. Anxiety is almost like physical pain, but for your brain. Now, physical pain, as much as we don't like it, it's important. So let's just say if I have an appendicitis and my stomach doesn't hurt, I'm going to be in big trouble, right? If you're standing on a cliff and you're not a little scared, you might get hurt. So anxiety is a warning system, but this is when it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem if you notice over time that you're worrying on more days than not for several months at a time. And that's leading to potentially restlessness, you're tired, you can't focus and concentrate, your mind might be racing, your sleep is disturbed, maybe you're not getting great sleep, maybe your appetite is changing because you're so nervous and worried. And at that point, that's when we say, you know what, this might be formal anxiety disorder and maybe pick up a real diagnosis of what it might be so we can address it. Now, all of this being said, I want to let you guys know that anxiety is a really broad term and there are a lot of different types of anxiety. For example, there's social anxiety, there's panic disorder, there's phobias where people are specifically afraid of certain things. So that's kind of anxiety in a nutshell, but remember, if you feel that you're suffering from anxiety and it's lasting for months and months at a time and you're worried and you have all those symptoms that I listed, that's when you really want to talk to a behavioral health professional about getting some help. So in that case, the first thing that you should do is pay attention to yourself a little bit more. Try and understand some of those symptoms that you might be having that we talked about. And then the best thing to do is talk to a trusted adult, a teacher, a school counselor, maybe even your parents to think about what the next step might be because in the behavioral health world now, we have so many amazing options for you. One could potentially be seeing a therapist. We have really, really good therapeutic interventions, talk therapy, to kind of figure out what's going on with this anxiety, what's triggering it, what can help make it go away. And then there's also medicine out there. So there are medicines out there that can help you as well. But most importantly, to get started, think about those symptoms that you're having and talk to a trusted adult. Hi, Dr. Dom. My name is JJ. I'm the mom of an 11 year old girl. How can I help her find her confidence? Self-confidence in kids. This is a big one, guys. And as parents, of course, we want to raise confident children. So when we notice some problems, we question, what are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? And you have a confidence problem. Well, we've done a lot of research. We meaning researchers and behavioral health scientists into how to make the most resilient and confident children and adults. We always come back to this major, major foundation and all the research supports that a foundation in a loving and supportive environment is key. And the reason we know this is because children that grow up with adverse childhood experiences, neglect, trauma, they tend to have much lower self-confidence. That might go without saying, but if the child is valued, if the child is growing up in a loved environment where you show interest in their activities and their thoughts and their feelings, you are off to a really, really good start. I'm just letting you know that right now. So that absolutely is the foundation. And this is the springboard. This is the foundation to springboard from to continue on this confidence building upbringing. The next thing 
Praise effort. There's been a lot of movement lately with regard to behavioral health sciences and confidence in what's called a growth mindset. And that basically means you don't always want to praise your children when they complete a task or get the A, but you want them to sort of understand very clearly that you're praising the effort, the determination to actually act on trying to do well. That's a very important point as parents, because for a very long time, we've been of this mindset that we only reinforce the final product, and that can actually lead to problems. So think growth mindset, think praising the effort of that endeavor that they're doing, praise their desire to do activities and be involved, and make sure you reinforce that in a positive way. As a parent, and I'm a parent of three boys, and this is hard sometimes, we need to teach our children that it's okay to fail. And I even need to remind the parents of that. It's okay to let your kids fail. Now that might sound crazy as a parent, but the fact is we learn from our failures. We know this psychologically. Let's just take an example. If you're learning how to ride a bike, if you're learning how to snowboard, well, guess what? When you fall down, you get up and you say, okay, I'm not gonna do that wrong again because that hurt or that was unpleasant. The same thing happens with our failures in life. We also need to know that we can get back up and we can gather ourselves and get back on the bicycle. Sorry for my metaphor, but it's true. So what we need to do is make sure that we allow our kids to know that failures are opportunities to learn more and to grow and to get back up. There's always that cliche, it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up. And there's actually a lot of scientific and behavioral health truth to that. So keep that in mind as well. Just remember, let your kids learn from their mistakes. You might have to let them fall. You might have to let them fail. With all of this in mind, another good point is teach your children problem solving skills. So when they do fail, when they do have a hard time, you have to teach them how to cope and how to deal and maybe look at things from a different perspective to foster growth. Part of this is encouraging some autonomy as well. So you can talk them through problem solving skills and part of those problem solving skills is, hey, you let me know what you think, how to fix this, and then we'll work on it together. So the point there is try not to do too much for them to fix things. Allow them to fix things themselves. Again, super hard as a parent, but really, really important for their growth and for their self-confidence moving forward as young adults. Something that I like to remind parents is, if you're the CEO of a big company, and you are, you're the CEO of your family, and you hired somebody to become the next CEO when you retire, if you do all of their work for them, and you retire, what kind of company do you think they're gonna run? Think about that for a second. So what you're doing in life, basically, is training that little CEO to run life and to run their own families. And if you've never taught them how to do it, if you've never let them fail, if you've never let them grow, if you've never allowed autonomy for them, then they won't have those skills when you're not there. So really, really important to think about a couple of those things. A couple of other things for confidence, encourage your children to be involved in group activities, encourage your children to be as social as they can be, and most importantly, I think the biggest one of them all is set a good example. Because more than anything, we know when we study child behavior and development, children model their behavior after their peers and adults and parents. So set the best example you can out there and your kids will be just fine. Hi, Dr. Dom, I'm Amira. I'm 11 years old and I'm really into soccer. My only question is, what happens if I don't make the team? So you don't make the team. First and foremost, this is unbelievably challenging and disappointing. Let's acknowledge that. Let's validate that. It's not a pleasant feeling. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. You know what? That's okay. Of course it's not a good feeling. It's something that you were trying to strive for and you didn't make it. But I wanna tell you that it's okay to feel disappointed, it's okay to feel upset, and it's okay to feel frustrated. These are normal feelings, and they're actually important. So I'm gonna share something with you guys right now, and I hope this helps you, because I wanna share something very personal. That my first try at getting into medical school, I did not get in. I wanted to be a doctor more than anything in the world, and I tried so hard, and I was rejected by all of my medical schools. Now, I could have given up at that point, and I could have said, well, I guess I have to do something else, but I was so passionate about medicine 
and being a doctor that I kept trying, even though people told me no, and even though I kept falling on my face. Everyone has setbacks, including me. So the first thing that I wanna tell you to do is know that that's valid and real, and it's okay to feel those things. Secondly, let's reflect. Let's use this as a learning tool. So I wanna encourage reflection, some self-assessment. Think about where you can improve. So you can get positive feedback from your coach. You can talk to your teachers. You can ask them where to improve. Use this. I tell people all the time, and people, it's, it's hard to get this across, but sometimes these little failures are actually gifts. They're blessings in disguise because it's the only way that you're gonna learn how to improve. As a parent, I want you to think about when your child comes to you and they're very, very upset about not making the team, remind them of their positive qualities. Because what'll happen is they'll go into this frame of mind where their perspective is focusing on all of the negatives. And we do that as humans, it's human behavior. We focus on negatives, it's called a cognitive distortion. So remind your child of all of their positive qualities and their past successes that brought them to where they are now. And that this is really just a speed bump. It's not an end to the journey in any way. I want parents and kids out there that are asking this question, I want you to know something that yes, certain talents are maybe genetic, somewhat innate, but the truth of the matter is this, for most of us, physical talent, academic talent, is not innate and it's not fixed, it's learned. But maybe there are other things you enjoy too, maybe you like musical instruments, maybe you like a different sport, maybe you like reading or writing or academics, or art, something like that. So think about some alternatives as well to make yourself a little bit more well-rounded so when you do have these setbacks, they're not so potent, they're not so powerful, and you can bounce back a little bit more and be a little bit more resilient.